and I have a set stamp annual Elizabeth Seton lecture series. It's been 16 years. Imagine. I bet some of you have been here every year. <laughs> The Religious Studies Department of the University, to, with the sponsorship of the Sisters of Charity, is pleased to bring to the mountain to our region another outstanding speaker, and this time in the person of Sister Joan Chittister. Before I introduce her to you, I'd like to continue our custom of recalling at the first session the origins and purpose of this series of lectures, and for that, I'll call on our usual stand-in, Sister Maria Sutherland, who is the Provincial Superior of the Halifax Province of the Sisters of Charity, to do that. Sister Maria. Thanks, Barry. I haven't introduced these for all of the 16 years, but <laughs> for a fair number. So on behalf of the Sisters of Charity who sponsor this program, I'd like to welcome you to this year's Seton Lectures. And I'd like to extend our welcome, too, to Sister Joan. Perhaps her topic and perhaps her own reputation have drawn so many here tonight. And Barry said 16, and my notes say for almost 20 years now, I guess they, that fits. The Elizabeth Seton Lectures have been offered at Mount St. Vincent. And their purpose, as your program indicates, is to make the Christian presence felt in a particularly tangible way by bringing to the campus and the surrounding community outstanding expressions of Catholic thought and life. In recent years, we have reflected on interpreting the scriptures, on healthcare decision-making, on social justice issues, and on the person in the postmodern culture. And this evening, we will hear the first lecture in this year's series on new questions for new times. As most of you know, Elizabeth Seton, for whom this lecture series is named, is the foundress of the Sisters of Charity who began Mount St. Vincent College many years ago to educate young women beyond the high school level, a very new idea at that time. We've certainly come a long way since then in claiming our place in the church and in society, but there are miles to go, and I'm looking forward to the light our speaker this evening may shine on the road. The series title, New Questions for New Times, brought me to take a new look at Elizabeth Seton. <coughs> Elizabeth was the child of new times. She was born in 1774, just seven days before the First Continental Congress met in Philadelphia to petition England to repeal the Intolerable Acts, thus taking the first major step toward the revolution. She was less than a year old when the shot heard round the world was fired, and only nine when she stood with her parents to proclaim loyalty to a new nation and a new flag as George Washington rode triumphantly into New York, the home of Dr. Bailey, his daughters, and his second family. Elizabeth's mother had died when she was three. At that time, the Catholic Church was just beginning to survive and grow in the American colonies. So a new world and a new church was Elizabeth's lifetime experience. One of the books I picked up as I was preparing this introduction summarized Elizabeth's life in four words, wife, mother, educator, foundress. And I thought of the four words in the title of tonight's lecture, and I wondered whether they might also summarize her life story. I could make three of them certainly apply. Of icon, I wasn't sure what that would mean. Woman, she certainly was. A woman who loved life, who was the belle of the ball in the New York society milieu in which she lived as a young woman. A woman who loved children and had five of her own. A woman who at 30 years old sat at the deathbed of her husband. A young widow who carried the responsibility of supporting her family a woman who lived through the loss of two of her children in their teens. Rebel, she must surely have seemed to her family and friends, when on her return from Italy after her husband's death, she announced her intention to join the Catholic Church, the Church of the Immigrants, 
to New York Episcopalian Society. Rebel too, when she set out with her children to open a school in Baltimore, far from familiar faces and places. Saint we know she was, the first native-born American saint of the Catholic Church, declared so by the Church in 1975. Indeed, as we recall Elizabeth Seton's story, even in such brief jottings, a story of suffering and struggle, of success and sanctity, I'm thinking she would be very much at home with the reflections that we'll share this evening. I'd like to take this opportunity also to express publicly again to the Religious Studies Department of Mount St. Vincent University the appreciation of the Sisters of Charity for their capable and creative administration of this lecture series since its foundation in 1978. It is with pleasure that we collaborate with them to offer tonight's program. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Maria. Some of you, I'm sure, know Sister Joan Ch Chittister, even if it's from afar. She is an international author and lecturer, the founder and executive director of Bennett Vision, a resource and research center for contemporary spirituality. She's a member of the Benedictine Sisters of Erie, Pennsylvania, past president of the Leadership Conference of Women Religious in the United States and the Conference of American Benedictine Prioresses. She is a social psychologist, among many other things, and consultant to religious communities. She has taught on all educational levels. She is the author of several books, numerous articles about religious life and contemporary issues. She has been awarded honorary degrees by a number of universities as well as awards for work for justice, peace, and equality in the churches. A few months ago, I picked up the National Catholic Reporter, an American Catholic newspaper, in which Sister Joan has a regular column. And I opened it to, I don't know which page, but anyway, to Sister Joan's column, and I read this. The headline says, one, two, three strikes, you're out in the old, ball, the old boys' ball game. <laughs> and the article starts, mark the month. Someday you may want to look back and be able to date the signs that marked your first intuitions, your beginning certainty that nothing was really as good as you had begun to believe. Most of all, point it out to your daughters. They will surely need to know how it was that a few set out to trample on their hopes and not the fabric of their lives. It happened in May of 1994, not subtly, but too quietly, perhaps. And that is the real tragedy. Three things have occurred in the past two weeks that are clearly designed to sound the death knell for women. But I'm sure I'm taking words from her mouth. <laughs> It is with great pleasure that uh, we bring to you, to us, Sister Joan Chittister, to talk this evening to us about woman, icon, rebel, saint, Sister Joan. Thank you very much. If you're Joan Chittister, it is lovely to have somebody applaud before you speak <laughs> because you have absolutely no idea what's going to happen afterwards. I want to thank uh, the organizers of this conference uh, for asking a woman to speak on the subject of women. <laughs> uh, this happens so seldom in history. Uh, I am... Uh, 
completely convinced that it is an important topic. And uh, though the, though the um, introduction was, was a warm and, uh, and receptive one, believe me, I would not be here under any other uh, credentials except my concern for women in general and the church as a whole. In fact, uh, the introduction that I prefer best is one that we tell back in Pennsylvania about little Alice Taft, who was being taught the fine art of self-introduction. And they say that on the day appointed to her debut, she got out in the aisle in her second grade classroom, put her shoulders back, put her tiny little thumbs on the seams of her skirt and said, my name is Alice Bowers Taft. My great-granddaddy was president of the United States. My dandy, my granddaddy was a U.S. senator. My daddy is ambassador to Ireland. And I am a brownie in the Girl Scouts. <laughs> now what you see, kids, is what you get. Just one more brownie in the Girl Scouts trying to make sense of the various riptides and undercurrents in which women, men, and the church find themselves at the present time. I know it's an important subject. Margaret Mead, the great anthropologist, said, there are four moments in the history of humankind after which nothing else was ever again quite the same. And she said, those moments are the period of evolution, the period of the Ice Age, the period of industrialism, and the period of the women's movement. There are four moments in history after which nothing else was ever again quite the same. And those moments are the period of evolution, the period of the Ice Age, the Industrial Revolution, and the women's movement. I really come in behalf, though, of another woman who lives in Pennsylvania, an old lady who has the creative but somewhat irritating habit of making left-hand turns from a right-hand lane. <laughs> they say that the last fella whose Cadillac she hit broadside got out, walked around the front of the car, leaned into the driver's window and said, Old lady, I just want to ask you one thing. Why didn't you signal? And she looked up at him and she said, Because, Sonny, I always turn here. <laughs> now, women know where they're going. <laughs> the rest of the world is only now catching on. <laughs> It's those turns that I want to talk about tonight when I address the subject, woman, icon, rebel, or saint. This reflection on the role of women in both church and society is both a good news and a bad news presentation. The good news you know as well as I do, lost as it sometimes gets. The good news is that great women have always walked the earth. Their footprints are clear even tonight. Their presence has changed things, and we know that, both in church and in society. The good news never to be forgotten by any of us at any age is Mary, Phoebe, Prisca, Junia, and Tecla, the founders, teachers, and deaconesses of the early church. The good news is Marthana, a 5th century church administrator who was a quasi-episcopal abbess and the superior of a dual monastery of both men and women. The good news is the Byzantine Empress Theodora who freed the prostitutes of Constantinople from the dungeons awarded to them by the men who used them. The good news is the church leader, Hilda, an abbess of the 7th century and a delegate to the church's synod of Whitby. Note well, those of you who follow the current synod, that this woman was a delegate, not an observer. The good news is the 10th century feminist dramatist, Nun Rotswitha, 
who wrote plays in the classical style of Terence and challenged sexism directly by claiming both her talent and her responsibility to it. She wrote, those who obstruct my God-given gifts do so at the risk of God's judgment. The good news is the Dutch scripture scholar, Anna von Sherman, who argued for the education of women with all the major figures of 17th century Europe. The good news is the astronomer, Carolyn Herschel, the 19th century woman who discovered all by herself eight separate comets, but who received only honorary recognition from the Royal Astrological Society of Hanover, Germany, because that most prestigious society was open to men only. The good news is the abolitionist and feminist Sojourner Truth, who claimed human liberty and spoke out for the freedom of slaves and the full humanity of both black and white women everywhere. The good news is Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell, the first woman in the United States to be a licensed practicing physician, though they destroyed her office and they drove her out of New York City bodily in this century because the fine, upstanding men of the Commonwealth Defenders of human standards all said, quote, it was immoral for a woman to be a doctor. The good news is Catherine of Siena, who counseled a pope, whether he wanted her counsel or not. <laughs> the good news is Joan of Arc, who claimed direct authority and power from God, whether the men of the church said that a woman could have power and authority from God or not. The good news is Dorothy Day, who called both this hemisphere and this church to account for their misuse of power, whether they would admit that they were misusing power or not. The good news is a lot of women over time who have resisted and confronted both church and state to be what God called them to be. The good news is our own grandmothers and great-grandmothers who had to struggle for the suffrage that you and I now take for granted. The good news is that despite pressure, despite rejection, despite false theologies of creation itself and false biologies of women, women have kept pressing, kept turning, kept thirsting for fullness of life and the pulse of holy power. At the same time, the bad news is that in so many years, so few women have ever come to know the opportunities, the recognition, and the holy power they deserve. The bad news for all of us, both men and women, both church and state, at this moment in history, is that the feminine in life has been suppressed over and over again in both men and women, and this time, perhaps, to our very peril as a human race. The new news is that the future of the church and the future of society itself may depend on the position this generation, you and I, take on the question of the role of women. The new news is that our churches and our generation, as never before, is being forced to choose, forced to choose, woman as icon, woman as rebel, 
or woman as saint. There are two very old stories that illustrate best, I think, the depth of this struggle of choice. In the first story, a disciple asked the elder, Holy One, what must I do to be enlightened? And the elder answers, To be enlightened, you must make a clean break with your weaker past. And the disciple answered, Well, I am doing that little by little. But the elder replied, no one crosses a chasm little by little. <laughs> to get across a chasm, you must take a leap. In the second parable, the disciples ask an elder to talk to them about power. And the sage says, well, once upon a time, there was a snake in the village that had bitten so many people that very few dared to even try to go into their own fields. So the village holy one came out and tamed the snake and persuaded it to practice the discipline of nonviolence. Well, it didn't take long for the people to see that the snake had become harmless. And so soon all the men and even the children of the town took to hurling stones at that snake and dragging it about on the road by its tail. Until one day, the Holy One found the snake badly bruised and bleeding and lying in a ditch on the side of the road. And the Holy One said, Friend, whatever has happened to you? And the snake said, I've been passive and gentle and uncomplaining, just like you told me to be. And the Holy One said, Oh, God, dear, there's been a terrible mistake. I only told you to stop hurting. I never said to stop hissing. <laughs> the points are clear, aren't they? <laughs> For life to be life, we have to take a leap and live it to the fullest. For a person to be a person and not a victim and not a scapegoat, they must claim their power and use it well. But the problems are clear too, aren't they? We have to know, you and I, what that leap requires. We have to know what kind of power we're talking about. We have to know, in other words, what it means to be icon, rebel, or saint before we can really choose to be any of them. But where shall people like us go to discover those differences? And what does that have to say to us in our time, tonight, as church, as society? My suggestion tonight is that we look to Scripture, people like us, to find both a model and a meaning of new life and new power for women. I'm going to suggest tonight as model of woman as icon Susanna, the daughter of Joachim and the daughter, I'm sorry, the wife of Joachim and the daughter of Hilkiah. I am suggesting as model of woman as rebel, Judith, the widow of Bethulia. And finally, I am suggesting as model of woman as Saint Mary, the mother of Jesus. In Daniel 13, the basic image of woman is made, I think, very, very clear. The scripture reads, in Babylon, there lived a man named Joachim who married a very beautiful and God-fearing woman, Susanna, who was the daughter of Hilkiah. Her pious parents had trained their daughter according to the law of Moses. Joachim was very rich. He had a garden near his house. And the Jews had recourse to him often because he was the most respected man of all. That year, 
Two elders of the people were appointed judges, of whom the Lord said, Wickedness has come out of Babylon from the elders who were to govern the people as judges. These men to whom all brought their cases frequented the house of Joachim. When the people left at noon, Susanna used to enter her husband's garden for a walk. When the old men saw her enter every day for that walk, they began to lust for her. They suppressed their consciences. They wouldn't even allow their eyes to look to heaven. And they did not keep in mind just judgments. Though both were enamored, of her. They didn't tell each other their trouble, for they were ashamed to reveal their lustful desire to have her. Day by day, they watched eagerly for her. And one day, they said to each other, well, let's be off for home. It's time for lunch. So they went out and they parted, but they both turned back. And when they met again, they asked each other the reason. And then they both admitted their lust. And then they agreed to look for an occasion when they could meet her alone. And one day, while they were waiting for the right moment, she entered the garden as usual with two maids only. She decided to bathe for the weather was warm. Nobody else was there except the two elders who had hidden themselves and were watching her. Bring me oil and soap, she said to the maids, and oh, shut those garden doors on the way out while I bathe. And they did as she said. They shut the garden doors. And they left by the side gate to fetch what she had ordered, unaware that the elders were hidden inside. As soon as the maids had left, the two old men got up and hurried to her. Look, they said, the garden doors are shut. And no one can see us. Give in to our desire and lie with us. If you refuse, we will testify against you that you dismissed your maids because a young man was here with you. I am completely trapped, Susanna groaned. If I yield, it will be my death. If I refuse, I cannot escape your power. Yet it is better for me to fall into your power without guilt than to sin before our God. Oh, there's no doubt about it. Susanna was a chauvinist dream of an icon, a Madonna figure of grand design, attacked but innocent, threatened but faithful. She is assaulted by two friends of her husband in his own home. And faced with public punishment or personal ravishment, Susanna chooses death to what men have defined as her dishonor. Indeed, Susanna is the perfect picture of the woman that men have made up for women to be. The scripture details quite clearly her innocence. She's not flirting. Her vulnerability, she's alone. And worse, perhaps, her complete 
dependence on men, both for her value and for her vindication. Submit to us, the molesting old men say, or we will defame you. We will defame you and bring you to death. Like any good icon, Susanna was an image of the ideal, the otherworldly, the frilly feminine of life. She stayed at home and walked in her garden. She was demure and devoted and docile and proper and pure and powerless. Powerless. I am completely trapped, Susanna says. If I yield, it will be my death. If I refuse, I cannot escape your power. And so Susanna was prey, despite her dutifulness, maybe because of it. And indeed, the icon Susanna is with us still tonight. Don't count Susanna out. Don't erase Susanna. Susanna lives in every woman tonight whose dependence renders her powerless to be what she should be and do what she should do. Susanna lives in India while you and I sit in this antiseptic auditorium and is being killed for bride price tonight or starved to feed her husband. Susanna is living in Japan tonight and she's being prostituted for the sake of, quote, the recreational opportunities afforded Western business firms for the sake of profit and pleasure while they negotiate. Susanna lives in the United States and in fact in all of the Americas tonight where she is commonly abandoned, usually left without alimony, and beaten by husbands and boyfriends, the government statistics say, every 18 seconds, while the courts wrestle with whether or not domestic assault is really a criminal offense. And while spouse murderers in the state of California spend an average of three years in prison. Oh yes, Susanna is the model woman who gets saved by men and scolded by men, slighted by men, and slapped by men. Who have all learned well that they not only have a right, they have a responsibility to own and sell and command and control and direct and determine and destroy whatever is theirs, and the Susannas of the world are definitely, definitely theirs. Because it is centuries of male biology and male theology and male philosophy and male legislation that has deftly, deftly created the image of the seductive, available, usable, and disposable woman. When Plato, about whom it is said, quote, all philosophy is simply a footnote to Plato, categorized women with children and animals in the Theotetus, and taught in the Timaeus that women are created, listen carefully, women are created from wicked men as a punishment for the man's having been irrational. You see your problem, honey? You don't come from good stock. <laughs> when Plato declared in the Republic, quote, there is nothing that women as a class can do better than men as a class, even in spheres reserved for women, Susanna was forever cast as derivative and deficient without real human role or genuine skills and personal gifts. 
You don't believe that, do you? You sit there and you say, wow, my God, are we lucky, huh? Whew. I don't know why she's talking about Plato. I mean, it's 1994 and at least we're not there. I'm going to repeat it. There is nothing <laughs> that women as a class can do better than men as a class even in spheres reserved for women. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. When you go to a five-star restaurant in Halifax, who's doing the cooking? That sister here. Who's cooking? <laughs> Your tongue will turn black if you tell a lie. <laughs> Every second grade teacher I know knows that. Who's cooking? Men, and we call them what? We put the little funny hat on their, on their head. When the hat goes on their head, their salary goes up $25,000. <laughs> when you really want a good suit or a wonderful dress, who makes it? Yeah, we go to the tailor. We go to Gucci. We go to what's-his-name. <laughs> huh? Guess who is teaching women how to have babies? Though we don't have an iota of proof that they know anything they're talking about in the field. Or at least that they've ever done it twice in a row. There is nothing that women as a class can do better than men as a class, even in spheres reserved for women. I taught this once in a... In a a public, uh, uh, uni or in a Catholic university where there was a large uh, seminary. And when I finished, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the young priests got up and he said to me, but Sister Joan, he said, you don't understand. I said, I give up. What don't I understand? He said, Plato was ahead of his times. <laughs> Apparently, I'm supposed to be moved to applause. <laughs> I find it very hard to respect the issue. When Aristotle taught that, quote, all of nature and most humans are simply instruments meant to supply, meant to supply necessities and comforts for the higher class. Guess who, kid? and that the world is naturally divided into the natural rulers and the naturally ruled, and that that hierarchical order was good, quote, for both the slaves and for the women, then at that very moment until this day, all the judges and the guardians and the molesters and the spokesmen, and the chairmen, and the male men, and the patriarchal family got created too, and legitimated. When Thomas Aquinas, sometimes loosely called saint, <laughs> taught that in the process of reproduction, females were responsible for the human body, but that male semen was the raw material of human reason and that women did not have, quote, sufficient strength of mind to resist concupiscence. All the violence of the world was released against Susanna and even civil law recognized the rule of thumb do you know what the rule of thumb is? It is that rule in British jurisprudence that gave a man the right to beat his wife, quote, for godly chastisement, so long as the weapon he used was no bigger around than his thumb. And we wonder why we can't get court cases heard today. We wonder why we can't get real protection before the murder happens today. We wonder why the latest social survey that asked men what they feared from women said being laughed at. And what women feared from men was being murdered. Indeed, 
all the Susannas of the world are trapped, except for the rebels. For if Daniel 13, the story of Susanna, is the stuff of icons, then it's the book of Judith that's a book for women who will simply not submit to the male image. The book of Judith is the handbook for rebels, for women who are achievers and doers and nonconformists and bearers of a restless urge to humanhood and a compelling call to live out the word of God in their lives immediately, not vicariously, and through their own calls, not simply through the lives of others. In Judith, God delivers the Jewish people through the instrumentality of a woman here as surely as God worked through Moses, God works through Judith as well. You remember the story, I'm sure. Cut off from water by siege for 34 days, the people of Bethulia are desperate and on the verge of surrender. All the tactics of the past have failed. All the plans of the men of the town have turned to nothing. All their power ploys have come to grief until the woman Judith comes to do a man's work, a woman's way. And the scripture reads, When Judith therefore heard of the harsh words which the people, discouraged by their lack of water, had spoken against their ruler, and of all that Uzziah had said to them in reply, swearing that he'd hand over the city to the Assyrians at the end of five days, she sent the maid who was in charge of all of her things to ask Uzziah, Chabris, and Charmus, the elders of the city, to visit her. And when they came, she said to them, Listen to me, you rulers of the people of Bethulia. What you said to the people today is not proper. When you promised to hand over the city to our enemies at the end of five days, unless within that time the Lord comes to our aid, you interposed between God and yourself this oath which you took. Who are you then that you should have put God to the test this day, setting yourselves in the place of God in human affairs? It is the Lord Almighty for whom you are laying down conditions. Will you never understand anything? Judith, who should have been at home, the law said, who had no proper part of the public world, whose place was off the streets and in the outer court of the temple, who was, the scripture says, quote, a very God-fearing woman, and maybe for that very reason, a very bold one, certainly a persistent one. Listen to me. She said to the leaders of the city, I will do something today that will go down from generation to generation among the descendants of our race. And that night Judith did what the men of the place could not do. She called upon God to fulfill the gift that had been given her and she said the first feminist prayer in the Judeo-Christian tradition. She prays, quote, Give me a widow, the strong hand, to execute my plan. Your strength is not in numbers, nor does your power depend upon stalwart men. But you are the God of the lowly, the helper of the oppressed, the supporter of the weak, the protector of the forsaken, the savior of those without hope. And Holofernes fell to the rebel woman Judith. And Judith has been followed in every generation by rebel women after her who know themselves also to be exiles in a male world. It was rebel women who rebelled against the 19th century physiology that taught in an English textbook that quote, ready, brain work renders a woman sterile. <laughs> now there's a birth control <laughs> that they never thought of. <laughs> Go back in 
the archives of women's communities and see what they taught. They opened the schools for the education of women, but what they taught them was how to read the scriptures, speak a little French, sing a little song, and do a little crocheting because the physiology was very clear. You had to be careful how much you taxed a woman's mind because brain work renders a woman sterile. Rebel women rebelled against the theology that taught that woman's only role was motherhood. They rebelled against the idolatry that made God's graven image male. The God who is all spirit has been found again in the desert. And this time the graven image is male. They rebelled against pornography, prostitution, domestic rape, slave wages, and war. They went to jail for the vote. They went to the government for equality. They went to school for education. And they went to work for economic independence. And historians are discovering along the way, unknown, unnoted, unthanked, and unrecognized, that they fashioned achievements that would live forever. In Varen Tachik's new book, Mothers of Invention, A History of Forgotten Women and Their Unforgettable Ideas, we find that the culture-changing machine credited to Eli Whitney as the, uh, as the cotton gin was really conceived, perfected, and marketed by Catherine Littlefield. But because a woman was not permitted to own a patent, have a business, make a contract, or hold a bank statement, she never made a cent. There is no record of his ever having given her a penny of the royalties. We know now, for instance, that it was a woman who patented the Navy's first signal flare. It was a woman who introduced smallpox inoculation. It was a woman who synthesized the first nitrate fertilizer. It was women who perfected solar heating and created the basis of computer software. Excuse me and developed refrigeration and produced the first usable penicillin and designed the first tract housing in 1994. And then they have the nerve to say, what else do women want? <laughs> and they call them rebels and viragos and Amazons and radical feminists and unnatural women. How many of them are there now? Well, in a Gallup poll of about five or six years ago, only 20% of the women sampled were willing to call themselves feminist. But over 80% of them accepted every single item on the national woman's agenda except one. What was it? Abortion. The only issue that divided women on women's role in society was the question of abortion. A similar survey that was conducted several years after that indicated that women over 50, and there are one or two of them here tonight, <laughs> only 22% of those women were willing to describe themselves as feminists, but 57% of the women in their 20s said they were. You know what that means, kids? It means that we got trouble right here in River City. They're out there someplace forcing the question. The National Opinion Research Survey said that half of the women over 50, but two-thirds of the women under 30 who responded to that survey said they rejected totally the definition of women as they perceived it in official church documents. And that is the stuff of which rebellion is made. And these rebellious women, the UN Decade on Women discovered, are in Asia and Africa and India and Italy and England and South America and here, right here, I bet, in Nova Scotia tonight. Why? Because as long as Schopenhauer's notion that a woman is by nature deficient, 
carries more weight in the structures of society than Mary Wollenstonecraft's contention that opportunity determines capacity. As long as Nietzsche's position that, quote, women should be brought up as dangerous playthings for the relaxation of the soldier, tail hook scandals will continue and tail hook cases will be lost to the women, gang rape or no gang rape. As long as that posture is more institutionalized than John Stuart Mill's analysis that no society can be called just as long as half its people, women, are kept in economic, social, political, or ecclesial subjection. As long as Freud's position that women simply want to be men <laughs> Honest to God, could we have the truth? I've been around the world now three times. I am looking, looking. If you're here tonight, <laughs> would you take the burden off my back? I am looking for these women who want to be a man. I have yet to have a woman of any age say, I don't like being a woman. I don't want to be a woman. I have heard them say, I want the same opportunities as any man has. As long as Freud is more acceptable than Karen Hornei or Alfred Adler when they say that women suffer from the same kind of suppressed ambition common to any class of oppressed people, then absolutely the rebel Judith will live struggling to be, struggling to be everything she's capable of being and often, yes, out of her frustration in ways that nice people call radical or unnatural, or uncouth, or even immoral. But why the fear and the resistance of women? If women are really as bad as they have been taught to be, then it's not necessary to suppress them. Don't worry about it. They're going to fail anyway. Until, until those attitudes of mind are sorted out, what shall people like you and I do? When we find ourselves pulled between the icon and the rebel, what's our answer? My hope is that we will raise up saints, women who are holy blends of both the icon and the rebel, Women who will give us both models of the feminine face of God and the power of the Spirit. Women who can make the improbable possible, who will defy the system for the sake of the sacred in a woman's life. Women who, like Mary of Nazareth, break through all the gossamer layers of false femaleness to bring feminine strength to a world that tonight is in danger of destruction from the institutionalization and the exclusivity of purely masculine values. Women who will bring peace to a planet that is reeling from macho mania with the confidence of the Magnificat singing in their souls. Mary of Nazareth is not what we have been told her to be. Do you remember, remember the book A Woman Wrapped in Silence? You know why they wanted her wrapped in silence, don't you? <laughs> they were afraid she'd say something. <laughs> they wafted her across the stage of the human psyche rendered her perfectly powerless, this woman who cooperated with the incarnation and turned the world upside down. Mary of Nazareth was not the vacuous woman. She was not a gossamer ghost. Mary of Nazareth knew very well what it meant to be strong. She was strong enough to know that she had been favored by God 
when the society said she couldn't be favored and the tradition said she wouldn't be so favored. She was strong enough to realize the strength of another woman. When she went to Elizabeth for her support and affirmation, not to the synagogue to try to persuade the priests of the legitimacy of their visions, not to the government for protection, not even to the men to whom they were espoused did these two women go to explain or cajole or plead. Oh, Joseph, I tell you, I know it was an angel. <laughs> you could see the gold on the ceiling. Oh, honey, get that look off your face. <laughs> Not a word except her decision. Her decision in a society hell-bent on stoning her to death. Her decision. No rabbi, no priest, no vote of the assembly. Her decision, her power, her call, her authority. No, those two women, Mary and Elizabeth, simply do what they must do together, and they leave it to the rest of us to do the same. Mary was strong enough to strike out in uncertainty because she was totally secure in her call. She was strong enough to bring the right concerns, the right questions, the right witness, the right insight into our world, even if it meant questioning the angels. And she did. When they talk about the wedding feast of Cana, they talk about one miracle, the changing of the water into wine. They keep the other one a secret. That was the changing of a woman into a leader in the church. I don't care what he says. Tell him I said, take that bucket and change it. It's an order, boy. <laughs> Jump! She was strong enough to expect a miracle and to get it right there in the midst of you guess who, who were all calling themselves the disciples. She was strong enough to withstand the so-called natural order of things so that the old order could be a better order. She was strong enough to bridge two worlds without losing the better part of either one. She was strong enough to never give up, to not be afraid, to begin over again and again and again after Bethlehem and after Egypt. And after the crucifixion, she knew who she was, and she let neither the society nor the synagogue tell her otherwise, though she stood for the best in both. Mary of Nazareth was not a pawn in the hand of irrational power. Mary of Nazareth was asked a question. Yes, you will, or no, you won't. And no woman has been asked the question since. Mary brought the power of the icon and the power of the rebel to white heat. Must I be a feminist? Yes. Why? Because Mary of Nazareth made feminism an article of the faith and feminine power holy. The psychiatrist Rollo May then tells us that there are five kinds of power. I'm suggesting that the kind of power that you and I choose will determine whether or not we ourselves are icon, rebel, or saint. The first type of power, the psychiatrist May says, is exploitative power. That's the kind of power that will use force against another one, another person, for my personal gain. 
slavery, white minority rule of native majorities are all, are all types of exploitative power. Chauvinism, the suppression of women by the definition of another whole facet of the human race is exploitative power. The second type of power, manipulative power, controls another person for my personal gain through tokenism or propaganda. Now, you know what tokenism is, I hope. Tokenism is that strategy. It is a social strategy that allows a few of the outsiders into the center of the system in order to keep the rest of that kind of people on the fringes of the system without being accused of doing it and looking good at the same time. Tokenism is one woman on the president's cabin. It's one woman in the crew, the spacecraft crew of six. It's one woman on the church council. It's one woman on the staff. Flee tokenism like the plague, because when you accept tokenism, you become complicit in the sin. Oh, I know the answer. Oh, Sister Joan, you know, though, you have to be very careful. <laughs> you know, they get so upset. You know, the male Lego just crumbles in front of you. You know, you've got to be patient. These things take time. Well, is 2,000 years tippy-toe enough for you, huh? <laughs> Flee tokenism like the plague. Why? Because the figures show that a woman, the token woman with a college degree, will earn on the average of $2,700 less per year every year of her life than a man who dropped out of high school at the age of 16. Indeed, tokenism is destructive, obstructive, immoral, insidious. And it's your part of the sin and my part of the sin. Propaganda is the other kind of manipulative power. Propaganda manipulates by dinning into the mind of people the fear of the communist threat, for instance, when the Soviet Union was a third world nation. It is, it is that misuse of a whole people that made it impossible for us to see that it was really our own first strike weapons that were destroying us financially, morally, physically. Propaganda it is that plies us with the notion of radical feminism. She's a radical feminist. I heard a radical feminist tonight. Is that right? What did she want? She wants to breathe. <laughs> she wants to turn her IQ test in for her paycheck. She's a radical feminist. We have to be very careful of those kinds. And we refuse to read, teach, hear, admit, recognize that the definition of feminism is feminism is simply a commitment to the equality, dignity, and full humanity of all persons to such a degree that we work to bring about the structural changes that will make that possible. Feminism is simply a commitment to the equality, dignity, and full humanity of all persons to such a degree that we work to bring about the structural changes that will make that possible. That's why feminism and femaleness are not synonyms. I repeat, feminism and femaleness are not synonyms. All men are not patriarchal. The system in which they function is. 
and all women are not feminists because they have bought into the patriarchal definition of themselves. Some of my best feminist friends are males and I consider them grace in my life because they are the only proof I have that what I hope for is real, is possible, is full of grace. Feminism is that commitment of women and men, men and women, to the equality, dignity, and full humanity of all persons to such a degree that we work wherever we are, whoever we are, to bring about the structural changes that will make that fullness of humanity possible for every human being born. But manipulative propaganda makes sure that we never imagined the warmth of the Soviet people or recognize how commonplace intelligence in women is or the liberation of the human spirit that comes for both women and men, both men and women in feminism. The third type of power, competitive power, works against another person to defeat them. Competitive power is what, what says that we need to be number one, on top, head of the house, the boss. So when you bar a woman from a male enclave, from clubs and unions and job categories and the pronouns of the church, that's competitive power, too. Two-thirds of the poor of the world are women because they can't get the same kinds of work or salaries or promotions that men can. You see, there's only one way to keep a woman inferior. If you're afraid you can't defeat her, then you simply don't allow her to compete. In the United States alone, that bastion of women's rights, they say, there are 420 job categories defined by the Bureau of Labor Statistics this year, but 80% of all of those employed feminists uh, south of the border are still employed in only 20% of those categories, and in the categories that do employ women, women are still the lowest paid of all. Check your own figures. I have. There is no difference. Clearly, exploitation and competition and manipulation are destroying us at every level, just as they destroyed Susanna and Judith. But there are two kinds of power that you and I can choose to develop in our lives, to demand in those around us, that is, nurturing power that certainly cares for other people and bends our lives to their empowerment. And also, integrative power, the power that brings opposites together to enable everyone fullness of life. That's the kind of power that Mary practiced in Nazareth, in Bethlehem, at the visitation, at Cana, at the foot of the cross. The well-kept truth is that Mary used her power to empower others, to bring things together, to fullness, to life, to make individual commitments and convictions with courage for life, to enable the fullness of life for everyone. Mary's power to say yes in a world that demanded that she say no for the sake of lesser things made her a new kind of woman and in the process made the whole world and all of its women new too. Like the seeker of enlightenment, it was Mary who took the leap for us away from the bloodless icon away from the isolated rebel to saint, to holy one of God by being everything she was meant to be. And she showed us that we can be it too. Mary, 
who turned God into the body and blood of Christ is a model for those women who seek to turn bread and wine into the presence of God today. The fact is that Mary is not simply Mary, the mother of God. On the contrary, the mother of God is the image, the model, the hope of women everywhere. It is the mother of God who is Mary, independent woman, Mary, the unmarried mother, Mary, the homeless woman, Mary, the political refugee, Mary, the third world woman, Mary, the mother of the condemned, Mary, the widow who outlives her child, Mary, the woman of all time who shares equally in the divine plan of salvation, Mary, the bearer of Christ. That's the woman who stands as icon among the women of the world and calls to rebellion all the women of the world who live in subjection or suppression. It's Mary tonight who's calling the typical rural African woman who's working 17 hours a day and the Asian woman who accounts for at least 50% of the food production of the country but gets not a penny of the income from it. It's Mary who is model for the third of the women worldwide who are the sole supporters of their families, but who are working without decent job opportunities, daycare centers, equal pay, or health and pension benefits. It's Mary who is the saintly icon who broke out of a lifeless mold and makes rebellion plain to legions of women whose supportive husbands pride themselves in their feminism. They'll say to you, I'm a feminist. I allow my wife to work. <laughs> and they're not telling the whole truth because what they really do is allow their wife to work two jobs. One job to help pay the bills and the other one to maintain the home and the children by cooking and cleaning and washing after the first job is done alone. Oh, that's our call, to practice the power that makes all things new so that others, all others, women as well as men, men as well as women, may have life and have it more abundantly. That's the good news. Not yet new news. The bad news for all of us, men and women alike, at this moment in history is that the feminine in life has been made into an icon or repressed into rebellion and suppressed in all our systems, even our churches, over and over again. So that as a result, humanity walks on one leg sees with one eye and thinks with one half of the human mind and it shows. Consequently, we stand tonight on the brink of extermination. Consequently, women are poor and minority women are the poorest of them all. And through it all, tokenism reigns supreme, both in the church and in the state. An icon here, a rebel there, middle management maybe, but nothing serious. Women readers but not women judges on the matrimonial courts. Catechists, but not deaconesses, despite 14 centuries of that tradition in the church. Women principals, but not priests, though the seminaries are empty and women's hearts are full of call. Why? Because we operate under the theology of domination. The theology of domination reigns supreme. The theology of domination says that God built inequality into the human race. But if you believe that, you believe that God created a lopsided creation and some of us are more human than the rest of us and they're in charge and they know who they are. 
But if you accept the theology of domination, then you see you are one short step away only from the extermination of red people, the lynching of black people, the napalming of yellow people, and the gassing of the next generation of Jews. That's why feminism is the radical justice issue. As until, until you have a feminist theology, you will have racism because domination is of the essence of anything not feminist. The problem is that competition and conformity and coercion have not worked, my friends. What the world needs now are the feminine values of compassion and consensus and cooperation. If the world is to survive and creation is to be fully created. On days when you are discouraged by the speed of the process and tempted yourself to give up, I'm begging you to remember just one thing after tonight. Jesus called the entire Christian community, women as well as men, Mary of Bethany as well as Peter, the woman with the issue of blood as well as the man with leprosy, the daughter of Jairus as well as the son of the centurion, Mary as well as Joseph, to know their power like his, to change the face of history. That's our duty. That's our duty, to change the face of history so that it takes a Jesus face. We have to give up being icons. We have to refuse to ignore our rebels. And we have to insist in ourselves, men and women, on the sanctity it will take to repeal laws, to provide equal opportunities, to change images and language, to envision new roles, to challenge systems, to refuse victimization, to demand economic equality, to renew our theology and refashion our own male-female relationships so that we can be friends together, neither of us, either too revered or too reviled. Do you want to be a saint? Well, saints, Elizabeth Seton would affirm, speak out, speak up, and speak on until the world transcends the sin of sexism. And that demands women of courage who will critique their lives and men of conscience who will call their own systems. The essayist Rostin wrote once, the purpose of life is not to be happy. The purpose of life is to matter, to have it make a difference that you lived at all. It's time now for our generation to make this difference. It's time for us to take the leap. It's time to change things. It's time to turn our icons and our rebels into saints. It is that for which, with Susanna, we struggle. It is that for which, with Judith, we hope. It is that for which, with Mary, we contend and contend and contend. Augustine wrote once, of the three theological virtues, faith, hope, and love, hope is greatest. Faith, Augustine says, simply says that God is. And love, Augustine taught, simply tells us that God is good. But hope teaches us that God will work. God's will. And then Augustine wrote, and hope has two lovely daughters, anger and courage. Anger so that what must not be may not be. And courage so that what should be can be. My prayer for you and your families is that you be blessed with a touch of anger and a burst of courage. Thank you for coming.
Sister Joan has graciously agreed to respond to your questions or comments. Um, in order to initiate this uh, process, I'd like to call upon Dr. Joyce Kennedy. Where is she? <laughs> there she is. <laughs> Who's the director of our Center of, of Continuing Education here at the Mount to uh, briefly react to, to the talk and uh, launch us into the question period. Joyce? This assignment is not fair. <laughs> I will just say a few words, but I'm sure my own heart reacted the way everybody else's did to what Sister Joan had to say tonight. Because what she's saying is not words, it comes from deep inside. And I think there's a resonance, certainly in myself and probably in everybody here who responded in the way they did. I'll just make a couple of brief comments and maybe raise some questions. Um, my comments are in the nature of looking at old images and then new images. And I'd like to say that nothing you said is far out at all. My own experience when I went to study theology here in town in a seminary setting for a Master of Divinity program, I went in very open. Um, I came out very angry. And part of it was I had no idea, as a Roman Catholic woman, um, what it meant that women were not priests. I mean, obviously, the priesthood was very important. It was something every family hoped some, in the, some boy in the family would aspire to. I thought it was a wonderful thing myself. Um, I had friends who were Anglican women who were at that time in the diaconate and looking toward the first ordinations in Nova Scotia. I believe that this was going to happen in the Roman Catholic Church as well, but as we can see, it's getting worse, not better from the point of view of hierarchy. At any rate, I went in with all this and I took canon law because every person who was studying for an MDiv in the Roman Catholic tradition and thinking of ordination took canon law. And what I fell over, literally, um, was the canon about the priesthood. Up until that point, I had this idea that it was only against the law that women could not be ordained. I mean, that, for instance, if you could find a friendly bishop who felt that you had the call and laid hands upon you and ordained you, you would actually have received the gift of ordination. You wouldn't be able to practice legally, but you would have valid ordination. But what I found out was, I think it was Canon 1026, it sounds like a weapon, and it is. Um, what I discovered was, oh, no, 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 no. It wasn't just, um, illicit or illegal, it was invalid. So that if I found a friendly bishop to lay hands on me and say I had the call and ordain me, it wouldn't take. Um, <laughs> I raised this point in class. I said, don't you think it's rather strange that um, you've just gone through 15 categories of men who were validly ordained but not licitly, like one was a raving psychotic and when you found that out, you he was validly ordained, but you wouldn't let him practice. And there was a whole list of them. But I said, if you laid hands on me, I'm reasonable, I'm not a psychotic, I've been working in the church for years, it just wouldn't take. Doesn't that put me in the category of the cats and the dogs and other subhuman species? And the priest who was teaching the class said, gee, I don't know what you mean. <laughs> End of story. Anyway. That's one of the old images. It's a very bad one. Another one I've been watching for the last two months, no, maybe a month or so, um, two weeks, three weeks, this series on baseball on Cable 4. Because I love baseball. I'm a Red Sox fan, and I've suffered. But anyway, <laughs> I went to the World Series in 1986. The marks are still there. 
Anyway, I watched the march, and it was all this stuff about this holy stuff. Oh, it's holy ground, holy tradition, playing with your sons. It was the American game. It was so on, so on, so on. And, but it wasn't for the whole people yet, because Jackie Robinson hadn't got to play. So I watched this and watched this and watched it, and I waited for them to say something about Jamie Robinson, but nobody ever did. And yet many of us out there wanted to be big league ball players when we were young girls, just the same as our brothers, and, and we couldn't even play little league. So that was another, that's another old image. And those of you who saw A League of Our Own, that very good movie, and saw women running in their midi skirts and blouses and sliding with bare knees into second base, know that women had the stuff. They could play ball. And yet there was no consciousness. There was a consciousness of segregation, but no consciousness that women might be part of that segregation. It was mentioned in a passing aside in a nine-part program lasting hours and hours. That's another old image. It just brings forth what Sister Joan is saying. Now a new image. Last Sunday I was listening to a sermon in my in church on Sunday, and it was about the reading was Genesis two, the creation story in Genesis two. And I was sitting there thinking about that story because it's sort of different from Genesis one, which is very clinical, you know, on the first day, the second day, the third day, the fourth day, the fifth day, and the sixth day. Genesis two is about how God is walking the line, he picks up some dirt and he forms it into a little creature and breathes into this creature the breath of life. And we were always taught, and until I read Phyllis Tribble, I always, it was a man. God created a man. But in her study of the scripture, she points out that the word has no sex in Hebrew. It was as if I would say, God created a human being, Adam, a human being, of the earth. And it's really interesting, that story, because I think the person who, who wrote, told that story in Genesis 2 was making a very good point, and that is that once God had created that sexless being like God, God created a being like God, a thinking, reflective being who could name all the rest of creation, because God brings all creation, animals and everything, and this human being names these creatures. But this human is lonely. So God made a mistake in that first round. This human being needed another. This human being looked at the rest of creation and saw gender, saw sexuality, and saw poor human being without it. God did not create a man. God created a sexless creature. And that creature demanded of God because of loneliness, gender. That's the new image, that even God had to correct, correct the mistake. Listen, Pope. Listen, Pope. Even God had to correct the mistake, you see? Because God saw the loneliness of this creature and said, I'll put this creature to sleep and I'll make this creature like the rest of this creation. I'll just, I'll have to do that because this creature's unhappy. And so the story goes on that the creature is put into this deep sleep and from the creature comes forth another creature. And at that point you have Ish and Isha, you have Lovers. At that point, you have he and she on equal footing from the same humanity. And it's interesting because the rest of the story says, says, and this is why this happens, that a man will leave his family and cling to his wife and the two shall become one. So that, that journey to be together. The human creature did not choose power, did not choose naming, did not choose that sort of thing, chose relationship. That's the new image, the image of Genesis 2. We're in it together. 
It doesn't matter if you're straight or gay or whatever. It's a gendered world of women and men. And we're in it together. And we're going to sink together or we're going to go on together. There's no other choice. We cannot continue with this domination, as Sister Joan says. So I throw that out as a new image. I like the image of Mary. But I like to go back to the garden and see this lonely human pining away for sexuality, gender, and companionship. And God looked and said, Oh, I'm going to get it right this time. So how can the church turn around and say, oh no, God, you were wrong. We're going back to the old idea. No way. That's how I feel. And I think that's how the writer of Genesis 2 felt as well. I want to thank Sister Joan. I think there are a lot of questions to ask, like how do you stay in the church? How do you do this and that? You get these questions all the time. What's the program of action? What can we actually do? How do we network with each other? You know, how do we keep from being so angry that we smash the people who want to help us? All questions that I'm sure you sit there and say, okay, that was a wonderful talk, but now what? What, What's the next thing that we can do? And that's my five minutes, Barry. So (laughs) you're welcome. So I leave it to Sister Joan to field many questions that I'm sure will be there. Thank you very much, Sister. Yeah, I'm, I'll say just a word or two in response to that, and then we can open it. You'll, it is washable. Feel free. I never wear anything that can't be cleaned. Um, <laughs> I, I want to make it perfectly clear that um, there are indeed. Now, tomorrow, I'm, I'm not going to respond to the to the wonderful, wonderful intervention about the creation of Adam, because that is, in essence, uh, has a great deal to do with tomorrow morning's presentation, or at least something to do with it. So I won't get off on that tonight. Uh, however, I do want to point out that all of the action plans in the world will change nothing until our own hearts and attitudes change. In fact, I kind of stringently avoid action plans, though I am very happy to point out the things that I see in front of me. For instance, um, I I, I told some of the sisters this last night, I tried to contribute to uh, turning the world on its axis a bit uh, by, by watching carefully when I am in a parish mass. I sit there with a little paper that you get in the back of church, and I carefully edit all of the sexist language. I circle it, and I number it, and I change it. And then when they pass the basket, I write on it, when I am welcome in this church, I will support this church. Then I sign my name, my address, and my telephone number, and I uh, I drop it in the collection basket because I don't know a faster way to get their attention (laughs) than the light bill. So there are things, there are, there are things we must do, but, but most of all, we must look at our own assumptions. And as, as Joyce said so well, we must go back to the first of the images, not to the intervening images. We, we have to begin, uh, the, at, at the time of the, um, of the race riots in the United States, Adorno Frankel Brunswick, a social psychologist of great repute in the States, uh, began to deal with the question, how do you account for the fact that the blacks did not burn Beverly Hills? They burned Watts. They burned Watts. And, and the, this, these social science researchers uh, developed out of their research what, is, what he called the nature of prejudice or the characteristics of the oppressed. The, there, there are five major characteristics of an oppressed people, but one or two of them um, stand out. The first is that an oppressed people internalize the message of the oppressor. 
Priests, wonderful, wonderful men, husbands, fathers, say to me after lecture, Sister Joan, I have three daughters. I want my...